welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for showing up and coming and supporting our speaker series. And uh, I'm really surprised to be saying this, but it's the last one in our speaker series. It's went by so fast and it's been such a great experience in bringing in people that we admire and bringing in people that are associated with our IGOV program that we want to show off to the rest of the university and uh, expose their good mind to all of you and, uh, and get us thinking about the really important things that we're all dealing with as Indigenous people and people in, in support of Indigenous struggles. And uh, it's an honor, a real honor and a real pleasure today to introduce Noya, who's uh, among all the people that we've met in our journeys over to Hawaii, uh, standing out as one of the people that we respect and admire the most. You know, it's an illustrious crowd and we've learned so much from our, from our friendship and from our working relationships with the people that we have over there, from all of the, the senior kumu down to the students and the community people. And Jeff and I both agree, and uh, Angela knows this now, that uh, there are certain people that stand out as having affected you, as having real uh, mana, real power. And uh, our friend Moya was one of those people. So we were really looking forward to bringing him and uh, giving you a chance to get to know him and hear what he has to say. Um, Noya was a... I don't think I realized that you didn't have your master's degree yet when we invited you, but uh, that just shows uh, that just shows that uh, the formal education sometimes has to catch up to the traditional education. And in terms of what No Way Out represents in my mind and from what I've experienced and seen him do, uh, he's far beyond a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and even a PhD in terms of what he knows about the land and knows about his uh, language and his culture and his teachings. And, uh, you know, he has a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Stanford University, which is an accomplishment itself. He's just about to get his master's degree, not the juicy one, not <laughs> He's just about to get his master's degree from the University of Hawaii, and then enter into the doctoral program in the Indigenous Politics uh, program at the University of Hawaii, which we are partners with now. And so we're going to have this continuing relationship with him. And so I'm looking forward to his sharing with you uh, everything that he has to say. But in saying that, He's also multi-talented in terms of not only having a good mind intellectually, but uh, he's a poet and he's a singer as well. And I understand that he's going to share some of that with you here today too. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn you over to our good friend, Moe Alcarato. He moku, he kanaka, he kanaka Hawaii e. O ake ake kane o papa wale nu ka wahine. No ho pula wa hana u ia kamauna wa ake. Hana u ia kamauna wa ake a o pua e kamauna wa ake. He keiki mauna, he maka hi apo kapu na wa ake e. No ho ho wa ake ia papa hana o ho ho ku kalani he wahine. No ho ho wa ake ia ha alele a wa ake a ha alele wa ake ia papa. No ho ya ho ho ku kalani, hana u ia o halo a nakalau kapalini, he keiki alu alu, kanu ia ulo a ela he kino kalo. No ho ho wa kea ya ho ho ku kalani, a hana u ia o halo a he ali'i, he kanaka o iwi e. Na halo a na la lani i a na lani e walu. O ka haalele honu a ke kane o na kaula ka wahine, no ho pula wa a hana u ia o ka hele he kane. O ka hele ke kane o ka i ka ai ka wahine. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o pālau he kāne, o pālau ke kāne o puana ka wahine. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o lāhapa pālau he wahine, o lāhapa pālau ka wahine, o Liam Peralto ke kāne. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o Charles Liam Peralto he kāne, o Charles Liam Peralto ke kāne, o Sylvia de Costa ka wahine. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o Charles Anthony Peralto he kāne, o Charles Anthony Peralto ke kāne, o Bernie Souza ka wahine. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o Joe Charles Peralto he kāne. O Joe Charles Peralto ke kāne o Valerie Miranda ka wahine. No ho pula wa a hanau ia o au o lia no ea o Peralto he kāne. Ea no au ka o pū a ka mauna. He maka na hā loa, he o hā na hā mākua. He kohola lele i ka makani. E ola, e ola na iwi, e ola ke kula iwi. I ka piko kapu o wākia e. Aloha. Aloha mai kāko. And mahalo for having me here. My name is Noel Peralto. I'm from a place called Waiakea uh, in Hilo on the island of Hawaii. Um, and it's really an honor uh, for me to have been invited here. And I want to start by saying mahalo and aloha to the indigenous people of this place, to the Oevi of this place, uh, for allowing us this space uh, to share. 
and uh, allowing for me to be here. And I want to thank also iGov, uh, Ty, and Jeff, and everybody uh, for welcoming me and inviting me to be here and share this. Um, it's truly a great honor for me. Uh, like, like Ty mentioned, I'm a student. Um, I'm 25 years old and uh, still learning a lot. And i uh, really honored to be able to come and share some of these stories with you guys um, from my homeland. And uh, to be able to have this space to do this and to share this in this knowledge with you guys. Um, you know, when I told my, a lot of my friends and family about uh, coming here to, to this talk, um, a lot of them were pretty surprised that, uh, <laughs> and, and really proud and happy for me too at the same time that, you know, uh, I had been invited to come this far to speak and to share. Um, and, you know, in reflecting upon that, um, you know, on my way here, I really thought about my, my journey here before I came here in 2011, first time here as part of uh, this exchange program, this class between iGov and the Indigenous Politics uh, Program at University of Hawaii, where I'm at. Um, and there's a saying that we have that was said um, by one of our chiefs, uh, Kamehameha II, Liho Liho. And he said, Nawaika oleaki ake mai. And what that means is, uh, you know, it was, it was in response to somebody who was complimenting him on his knowledge and his wisdom. And um, he, what that basically means, what he says was, you know, why shouldn't we know? Why shouldn't we know? This is a pathway that's been well-traveled by our ancestors, by our parents who came before us. And so in thinking about that as, uh, you know, I was on the plane ride over here, uh, making my way back here, you know, it re really made me think about this pathway, this pathway that connects this land with the land that I come from uh, in Hawaii, and how it really is a pathway that's been well-traveled by our ancestors that came before us, and how this exchange, this relationship has really served to kind of restore and reconnect us to that pathway. And so I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today, um, as the title of my talk suggests. Um, but I started off with a ko'ihonua, um, a genealogy chant, as a way of introducing myself um, and introducing those ancestors that came before me and that allow me to be here and that make up the, the foundation of who I am and who I am standing here before you sharing these stories and the perspective, the, perspective, the worldview that I come from. It also introduces the place that I come from, and that's really... Um, the central focus of my perspective, and I want to put that out there, uh, I'm not trying to hide it. Uh, you know, that's, that's the foundation of who I am, and that's the foundation of all of my work, and um, I think all of our work as people, too. Um, and so one place that's mentioned in the beginning is Mount Awakea, and this is a picture of it here. Uh, it's our highest mountain uh, on the island of Hawaii. It's the highest mountain in all of the Pacific and uh, if you measure it from the bottom of the seafloor to the top, it's actually supposed to be the highest mountain in the world. And uh, we consider it to be our most sacred mountain. And uh, in our genealogies, it talks about uh, Mauna Wakea being the firstborn child of Papa, the earth, and Wakea, the sky. And um, so the islands were born from Papa and Wakea, and then the mountain of Wakea, Mauna Wakea, was born as a firstborn child of Wakea. And that makes it sacred in that sense, because the firstborn is the most sacred, um, as is the island of Hawaii, the firstborn island of Papua and Wakea. And so I introduced that as the place where my ancestors' bones rest, and as my own pico, my own umbilical cord, where I am centered. Another ancestor that I name is Haloa. And this picture here is a picture of Haloa. It's the Kalo plant. And um, in our genealogy, it talks about those same ancestors, Papa, the earth, Wakea, the sky, having given birth to a daughter, Ho'ohoku Kalani. And then Wakea gets together with his daughter, Ho'ohoku Kalani. They give birth to a stillborn child, Halo Nakalau Kapolili. And they bury it near the house. And from his grave grows this Kalo plant. And the Kalo has became our, um, our staple food uh, because the next born child, that, Pup, that Wakea and Ho'ohoku Kalani had, they named after Halo. They named him Halo. He became a chief, and he became a human ancestor for all of us, Kanaka, Oivi. And so the Kalo plant is the embodiment of that relationship uh, that we have genealogically as uh, descendants of the land, descendants of our Akua, our gods, and as 
the living descendants of Halua, which feeds us. And so I wanted to just start out by recognizing those kupuna who I bring with me here today. Um, and really as the, the foundation, the backbone, the kuamo'o, as I'll be talking about for everything that I do. Um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with, I'm from the island of Hawaii. And uh, the island of Hawaii is located right there in the middle of the, the world. It's the center of the world. <laughs> center of the Pacific. Um, uh, it's a, I don't know exactly the distance, but it's a, I think it's a few thousand miles away from here. Um, and the place in particular on the island of Hawaii that I'm going to be talking about where my family comes from is Hamakua. And that you can see here, Hamakua. Um, and one of, the way, one of the names that we have for Hamakua poetically is Hamakua Ikealo Ulili. And what that means uh, in one, I guess, translation is Hamakua of the steep trails. Ala is a trail, and Ulili refers to the steepness of it. And as you can see, our Aina is very steep and rugged in Hamakua from, I don't know, that it's kind of light, uh, but at the seashore, it's these huge high cliffs, about uh, 100 feet plus. And then all the way up to the tops of the mountains, um, Mauna Wake is about 13,900 feet. And then in the back, it goes all the way to Mauna Loa, which is about almost the same height, just a little bit um, smaller. But we have a very rugged landscape, and so our place was known for its steep trails. Um, but I'm going to leave that kind of interpretation for now and take another look at that same word, uh, Ala Ulili, from Hamakua. And so Ulili, um, not only does it refer to the steepness of land, but the Ulili is also this bird here. And I thought it was uh, fitting today for this talk because um, this bird is actually really interesting because it migrates uh, every year uh, between the lands of the north up here, and I don't know if it actually comes into this area specifically, um, but from Alaska down through Canada, you'll see this along the shoreline. Uh, they call it the wandering tattler. Uh, we call it the ulili. And, it, and in the wintertime, it makes its way south to Hawaii and to other places in the south, other islands in the Pacific. And it makes this long journey across the ocean. Every year, summertime, heads back up north. And, um, you know, another, another animal that, does, that travels along this same pathway is uh, the whale, the humpback whale. Uh, and the humpback whale does that same journey every year. Um, and in our language, we call the humpback whale kohola. And um, we have uh, like a riddle, uh, a riddle that talks about kohola. And it's ku'u a nonakala. And if you translate that literally, it means my, my fish that controls the sun, or for whom is the sun? And the answer to it is kohola. And you break down that word kohola, the first part of it, koho, means to choose or to follow, or in this context, to control. And la is sun. And so if you're familiar at all with the way that the, the earth moves and the sun moves from solstice to equinox to solstice, um, it kind of moves on a, you know, from, if you're talking about the summer solstice, the Capricorn of Capricorn, Tropic of Capricorn, which we call Aupolohiva Akane, as the sun moves south down to the winter solstice, the Aupolohiva Kanaloa, the Kohola follow the sun. And then as it, as it returns back up north uh, to the Aupolohiva Akane, the Kohola return north. So in that way, the Kohola, the Koho, the La, they follow the sun. And if you really start to break down the way that we look at um, the world around us through our language, you start to see these connections. Uh, with our place names as well. And so the reason why I've been talking, I've been researching about Kohola in the last few years is because the specific place within Hamakua that my family comes from is called Kohola Lele. And um, Kohola Lele, if you break down that place name, Lele means to jump or to breach. And so Kohola Lele is the, the breaching or jumping whale. And this is uh, what you see here in the picture is Kohola Lele is a, is a sacred place. It's a place of refuge. It's a pu'uhonua. Uh, it's a place of knowledge. And its name invokes the nature of the Kohola, which, and its ability to dive down to the deepest depths of the ocean, and then to rise to the surface, and then even to jump out into the next realm, the light, you know, in, outside, of the, outside of its own home realm, the ocean, and into the next realm. 
And um, I'm going to expand upon that later in my talk. But um, as this picture shows you here, I don't know if you're able to see, but there's two kohola that are spouting there in the distance, right next to the pulley of kohola lele. And uh, it was really amazing. This, I took this picture just about two weeks ago. Uh, and the kohola are still in our waters. I think they're about getting ready to head back up this way. Um, and so for me to be invited here during this time uh, was really a special thing for me because it represents to me, you know, this reconnection and this restoration of our pathway, this pathway that is actually very well traveled to this day by these ancestors of ours, the Kohola and the Ulili. Uh, and so that brings me to the title of this talk, Ikama um, Aina no Mako Ikikuamo. And what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to share a few stories and a few poems and uh, a few mele and, um, and more photos um, uh, that will hopefully help to give a more vivid depiction and representation of this place that I come from and the work that I've been involved with uh, over the past few years and the connection that we share as indigenous peoples working towards transformative change in our own communities. <clears throat> So, uh, instead of giving you guys just a literal translation of, the, of that title, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to explain it and break it down um, by starting off with a story um, that actually comes from and takes place in Kohola Lele. Um, so there's a story of, uh, that we have. It's an old mo'olelo, old story, uh, called, and it's about a young man named Kamiki. And... Kamiki, uh, he was from Kona. Uh, the Kona part of our island is on the opposite end from Hamakua. So Hamakua is up on the northeastern side, and Kona is on the southwestern side. And so he and his brother, Makaiole, um, they were in training to become Olohe Lua, uh, like experts in the martial art of Lua. And um, as one of their final tasks, their grandmother uh, sent them on a journey around the island to kind of test their knowledge. Uh, against some of the best experts around the island and some of the chiefs around the island. And so they make their way from Kona around Ka'u, Hilo, and then they come to Hamakua. And the first person that they encounter there is an old man. Um, and he's right alongside the trail, and he's tending to his, his kalo patch, his garden. And um, the old man sees them coming, and he doesn't recognize them. And so he, he calls out to them. He says, Malihini. You know, are you guys, you guys must be foreigners here. And Kabiki responds, he says, And so what that means is, he's telling this, this guy, we're not, we're not malihini, we're not foreigners. We are kama'aina, we're from this place. And kama'aina... Uh, means that you're a native of that place. Uh, and he says, and it's because you don't travel regularly along this kuomo, along this path, um, that you are not familiar with us, and you think that we're foreigners here. And now Kabiki, he's not really from that place, right? He's from Kona. But he's still asserting this knowledge as a kama'aina of that place to Koholalele. And um, what really stuck out to me in this mo'olelo is these two words that Kamiki uses. Uh, Kama'aina is the first, and kuomo. And so Kama'aina, as I mentioned, is it's a native of a place. Uh, it literally means to be a child of the land. Um, and the second word, kuomo, um, it has a number of meanings. So in the context of this story, it could be taken that it's just you know, a pathway, a trail. Um, but kuomo also refers to our genealogy, uh, our backbone, our ivi kuomo and our ways of life, or our customs. Um, mo'o, that word mo'o, uh, it really speaks of continuity, of succession. So our mo'o lelo is a succession of our stories, of our words that are told over and over and over again. And um, so what Kamiki, Kamiki suggests here in this mo'o lelo is that the relationship between the kama'aina, the one who is native to a place, who is familiar to a place, and the kua mo'o, is one in which the kama'aina is the one who regularly travels along that kuomo, 
the one who is committed to maintaining that kuomo of that place. And so we see here that it's all of these things that are embodied in what it means to be kama'aina. <clears throat> Thus taking it further, our paths, our lifeways, our kuleana, our responsibilities in life are determined by our genealogy. Um, the paths that are established by those who came before us, our ancestors. And in this way, our kuomo define us. They define who we are. As I started off with um, my own genealogy, that's my kuomo that defines who I am and that defines my responsibilities in life. Um, and it is the paths that we travel and the paths that we create for our descendants. It's the backbone that allows us to stand here today. And hence, i kama'aina no ma koi ke kuomo'o. We are who we are. We are kama'aina because of the kuomo'o that holds us here. <clears throat> and so I want to talk now about um, some of the research and work that I'm currently involved with right now. And this project that I'm actually working on is my uh, master's project. Um, but also just uh, a project that I'm involved with as part of my community at home that I've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, work on as a student uh, in a graduate program. Um, so in this, um, over the past five years as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student um, and as a member of the community, I've been working on a project of restoring and um, maintaining as well as creating kuomo'o in uh, my own homelands in Hamakua. Um, and this is a, we have, I guess we have a choice to do a, a thesis, like a traditional plan A thesis, written paper, or a plan B community project. And it was actually after I came here in 2011 that I decided, you know, I wasn't going to do the thesis. I wanted to do something like, uh, you know, the projects that are done here in this program do a community-based project, something that could address the urgent needs of my own community at that time. And what had been happening at that time is that we had recently organized this group, Hui Malama Ikiala Ulili. And um, just to give you a little background on where, I, where we're from and what kind of led to the formation of this group, um, in Hamakua, we have a long history of erasure and uh, desecration of our kulaivi, our homelands. Uh, back in the late 1800s, starting kind of in the late 1800s through the 1900s, um, Hamakua was determined as one of the prime areas for sugarcane uh, in Hawaii. And that was when the sugarcane industry was really starting out and really starting to grow. And so thousands of acres of our lands were just completely clear cut of our forests, and um, it was all in the lowlands, and that's where our communities were, were settled. I mean, that's where our people lived, our kupuna lived. And so in the process of clear-cutting all of these lands, a lot of these lands were also just completely dispossessed from our people, so our people were displaced. Um, so it was a near complete erasure of this landscape. Um, and in that same way, what also happened as a parallel to this, what's happening on the land, was also that... Um, as this disconnection and displacement occurred between our people and this landscape, also the stories and the chants and the knowledge that was embedded in this land and still is embedded in this land began to become displaced as well. Um, and so you can see that even to this day we deal with in the, in the politics of things. Uh, this is a quote from an environmental assessment um, that was done in 2010. And you know, they're talking about the cultural history of this area, Koholalele. And they're basically saying, you know, we couldn't find anything really about the history. Um, there's not really anything written down. You know, Koholalele is mentioned in that story of Kamiki, but they couldn't read Hawaiian, so they just saw the translation and said, oh yeah, it's in the story. But you know, there wasn't really anything going on there before because it was too hard to get down to the ocean because of the big cliffs and stuff. So. You know, it's these kind of narratives of almost a, a void, you know, that there's no people there, there's no history there um, that we recognize. And um, also it took place in, in 2007, uh, one of the major landowners in Koholalele area, uh, a big ranch, basically um, was creating a big water catchment system 
they bulldozed about five acres of one of our largest uh, burial sites. Um, and so that event kind of served to bring a lot of the families from this place back together, um, surrounding around this issue to take care of our Ivi Kupuna, the remains of our ancestors. And really, uh, we have a saying, Ho'i ho'i ka Ivi Kuamo'o, uh, which means to return home, to return to that kuomo'o, to that backbone. And in, and in that sense, it was real, a real literal return to taking care of the bones of our ancestors. And, you know, in, in doing so, we, we really saw the need to organize our efforts and to come together. And so we formed this hui, this organization. Um, and when we were thinking about a name, you know, we talked about different options. And then we talked about this, this place, you know, Hamakua. What is our kuamo'o? And it's the ala ulili. It's the steep trails. And so we decided to call our, our group hui malama iki ala ulili, the group that cares for and protects the ala ulili, the steep trails, recognizing that the work ahead of us is a steep trail. And instead of turning away from it, as most people would, we embrace that. And we embrace that as what, who we are. And we, we ascend that steep trail. Um, and so over the past few years in particular, we faced a lot of challenges um, in dealing with this burial issue, dealing with landowners, dealing with the state and federal government, um, dealing with the military. Um, and we recognized a need to build capacity for our community, for our organization, and to cultivate, really, to cultivate critical consciousness and to bring out these stories and this knowledge that's embedded in our landscape again, um, and to bring it into our community first as a means of empowering our community again and building that capacity and that awareness, that consciousness of place, and um, as well as a way to counter um, that narrative of void, you know, that narrative of erasure, um, to show that, hey, we're still here, and our stories are still here. We know, the, our, we know this place, and we know the knowledge of this place. Um, and so what came out of our discussions was the, the idea to create a website. Um, and it, was, it came out of an urgency to provide access to this information, that a lot of these resources, um, and I'm talking about historical documents, maps, um, land documents that come from the 1800s, uh, old newspapers that were written in our language in the 1800s, a lot of this stuff is held in archives on the island of Oahu in Honolulu. And for people from Hamakua, that's an hour drive to Hilo to the airport, and then an hour flight to Honolulu, and then another hour to get to the archives, and then you gotta figure out how to research stuff in the archives, which is a whole other thing. So we wanted to make it accessible to everyone, to our community especially, um, and for free. You know, that's another thing. <laughs> um, and we wanted to be able to create a website that would present these stories, these mo'olelo, from our perspective and on our terms and as a means of both empowering our community and, and countering these prevailing notions of void, um, of the void of this landscape of its indigenous past, present, and future. Um, and if, and this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of narrative of, of void and this erasure is reflected in if you do a Google search today on Hamakua, uh, you'll find hundreds of hits that will show up and they'll talk about Hamakua land for sale or the plantations or the cattle ranch histories or even tourist destinations, but not one of them will talk about our history of that place. And so the idea is that now um, there will be at least one that will show up and hopefully it will be the first one. <laughs> Uh, so what I want to do now is kind of just give you guys a brief overview of some of the website. Um, this is the home page. Uh, and, it's, and it's really meant to be really visual, really uh, to capture people's attention uh, through, our, through the photography. Um, all of these pictures up here are all pictures that I've taken. Um, and so that was kind of the main thing, is to catch people's eyes, catch the sensories that are really trigger these memories within us. Um, we have a page on Mo'olelo Aina. Um, oh, resign in. Okay. Okay. So basically, what this is is not only a website that's created as like a platform for our for our organization to be able to 
uh, spread the word about the work that we're doing now and to kind of get you know, the word about the struggles that we're enduring and try and organize people around that. But it's also really mainly uh, a resource website. So a resource website for the community to be able to come and find these stories. Um, and also a resources for their own research, um, mainly genealogy research and land research. And so uh, everything is kind of meant to be really interactive. And I'm going to say also that I'm not a web designer. I'm not a tech guy. Before this, I didn't know how to work. I didn't know how to make a website. I had one of my friends that knew how and taught me. And so after talking with my family, my ohana, we said, OK, website is what I'm going to do. So I met with my friend. She gave me a quick breakdown. And I just went and did it. So this was a learning process for me, too. Um, but it came out pretty cool. Um, we have an interactive map, so you can click on Hamakua. It will go there, give you a little bit of background on Hamakua a map of the particular area that our hui is in. And you can see Kohola Lele there. And then uh, each page has uh, links to, uh, has photos uh, of the place, um, as well as links to maps, uh, mele, which are chants or songs, mo'olelo, old stories, olelo no eo, wise sayings, as well as um, some of the old records. But all I'm going to do, um, I'll just show you guys the page uh, for Kohola Lele as we talked about here, breaks down the place name a little bit, a uh, little bit historical background. Um, one thing with language, um, I'm a student of our language, very much so, and I think it's, um, it's a huge part of our resurgence as a community, and so I was very conscious about embedding our language into this, um, and, not, and trying to translate as little as possible, but still offering that translation, recognizing that even within our own community, there's still such a huge majority of our people that don't speak our language yet. And so still being able to make that knowledge accessible to them right now, um, while also providing and privileging our own language in this whole setting. So there's, uh, I found a way to, like, instead of translating Hey Yell, um, you can click on it and it goes to our online dictionary that has all the different meanings of Hey Yell. Um, and so you can kind of do your own kind of research as you go and learn the language yourself as you're going through it. Um, we have uh, Mo'olelo. And uh, what I did is I went through, throughout some of my own research, going through our old uh, Hawaiian language newspapers from the 1800s, I found uh, like clippings that talked about stories from, where, from, these, from these lands. And um, the cool thing about the newspapers at that time is it wasn't like the newspapers we have today. Uh, they had news and what was going on, but our ancestors really took on, you know, they really took to this, uh, this new technology at the time. And they wrote down our old stories. There's like series of our mo'olelo that were print, printed each day or however often the, the news was printed. They would like put a, like, a little chapter and then the next one would be the next chapter and people would follow along. And so now we're starting to get back into these and like compile them all and put them into books and stuff like that. But um, so right here, there's one story, and I've linked this, so you can actually go to the online database that has the full newspaper, um, so you can see everything else that was going on that day. Um, but then also, you know, I have a transcription of the Hawaiian language and a translation in English. Um, and in this particular story, uh, it's about this guy. Um, he, was from the, he was from Kohulalele, and one night he went down to the ocean, to the cliff, and it was a really stormy and rainy night. Uh, and they had just, the government had just recently built a landing um, for ships to come in, and particularly for ships that were uh, unloading and uh, getting, I guess, refilling uh, resources. And so they, like, they dug out and dynamited this ramp down through the cliff. This is like a 100-foot cliff. And then they built a landing down at ocean level. And this guy was watching this, and the storm and the wind was coming in, and the waves just tore that landing apart. And um, this scene kind of recalled in him uh, this old saying from that place. And it's, And so I have a link to that. Um, and it has a translation, which means, Everything is destroyed by the wind. And, the, and as the Ailoa wind, which is the really strong wind of that place, just comes ripping through. And so as an alternative to that English translation, um, 
also put in a video that kind of demonstrates, you know, that wind and that waves of that place. This is standing where that landing was. Um, and so it's a way of really trying to translate our language through imagery as opposed to translating it into English. Um, imagery and sound and really sensory. <clears throat> and then the last thing, the last part of the website I'll show you guys is this page. Um, so in uh, this area, there's, uh, as I mentioned, the Ala Ulili, the steep trails. There's one trail in particular that's a really important one. And it starts down at the ocean, here you can see. And uh, it goes all the way up to the summit of Mauna Kea. And um, this is like only one or two trails that went all the way to the summit because that was like the most sacred region. Only very few people went up there. Uh, and it was only for very specific purposes, for a ceremony, uh, for burial of certain ancestors, for uh, depositing the, the pico, the umbilical cord of a newborn child. Um, and so this is the trail that uh, we have been working to reopen access to, to regain access to. Because of this history of displacement, um, a lot of this has been cut off to our access for generations. And um, this is part of that trail is what we access to go take care of the burial site that we've been taking care of um, for the last few years. And so you can kind of go through the different um, vol. We have vol, they're like environmental zones as you go from the ocean all the way up to the top of the mountain. And uh, not too many people know that in Hawaii you can go from the beach to the Arctic, uh, you know, snow at the top of the mountain in a, the minute, you know, just an hour or so. And so um, on this website, what you can do is travel along that trail in a way. Um, you start down at the ocean, uh, and it will show you pictures of that area, give you a little brief history of that area, what the cultural significance of it is, and then also as well as some of the things that are going on there today. And then you piiuka, you climb, you ascend, and you go up to the next realm. And uh, you can also iho ikai, you can return back down and... Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a way of experiencing that trail, that ala ulili, in the way that we experience it, in a sense. Um, and it's kind of creating a new kuomo, a new pathway uh, of transferring this knowledge to other people in our community. Um, and then, so like you can see here, the kuahea is the area where um, uh, our burial sites are located. And at the top of the mountain here, the kuahivi, uh, the highest, most sacred region. Uh, we're currently involved as on a broader scale. Um, there's a broader struggle to protect this mountain from uh, current development of astronomy, uh, astronomy uh, observatories. And right now there's actually 13 of these observatories up on the mountain. And they've proposed to build one more, which would be the largest in the world. And just to give you an idea of the scale of these things, uh, the one that they've proposed would be uh, the size of about five football fields in an area and 18 stories high. And uh, that would be the largest building on our entire island on the top of our sacred mountain. Um, and so I actually have a link here where you can link to one of the other organizations that's kind of leading the way in um, you know, fighting against the observatories and protecting the mountain. So you know, it's kind of cool how you can use the website you know, the internet as a way of branching out, you know, and connecting to other people who are in similar, similar struggles and sharing that knowledge as well. Um, and so, you know, it's not without its drawbacks, and I'll leave that for questions if people have later, but um, what I'm going to do now is just, uh, I'll return to the presentation. And um, so now, you know, on our aina that had its native vegetation clear-cut, uh, and its native people nearly completely displaced. Here we are, you know, the kalo kanuoka aina, the kalo plant that is deeply rooted in our land and that refuses to go away, that refuses to die. Um, if you cut a kalo plant and you leave the root in the ground, it's going to grow back up no matter what. And so here we are, sprouting forth again. And, you know, sitting in on the class yesterday, um, Tai and this, you know, everybody was talking about the struggle in uh, Oka that occurred in the 1990s. And um, 
Ty said something that made me uh, remember a poem that I had written uh, when I was here last time and kind of came out of all the experiences that I've had at home and the struggles we had at home and then relating it to what I had learned here. And he said, um, you know, we need to let a thousand okas bloom uh, and kind of referring to the, the fact that if we, need, if we want to see the, the overall transformative change on a grander scale, we need to have these kind of things bloom in every community around, you know, our landscape. You know, this, this thing needs to happen in every place. And so, you know, this is our way of trying to start and bloom our own, you know, resistance and movement out of our place. Um, and so, I'll share that poem now. Um, it's called uh, Recolonization. <clears throat> so, turning soils of remembrance and pulling weeds of dependence with hands reconnected to genealogical relations resurrected, planting seeds of resistance that bear fruits of resurgence, cultivating critical consciousness in cycles that remind us of our timelessness, reciprocating what the ancestors have taught us we must sacrifice for the next generation's harvest. <clears throat> and so, you know, what that poem really talks about um, is this idea that uh, the work that we do is really about planting seeds, uh, planting, preparing the soil, preparing the soil and planting so that, and sacrificing for the future generations of our people. And being able to have that foresight to know that uh, the sacrifices, we have to make sacrifices today to enable to, uh, to enable our future generations to be able to harvest those, those fruits. And the same goes for the Kuomo'o, these trails that we travel. You know, every time we go up the mountain, we have to be conscious of the way that we treat the trail because if we wreck it, we tear it up, and we leave it worse than when we got there, then our, the people who come after us will have a hard time, and eventually they won't be able to travel along that trail. So as we travel these trails, we have to maintain them. We have to improve them. And sometimes you have to create new trails uh, to adjust to the, the time and to adjust to the circumstances of the time. And so, you know, what this, these experiences have really taught me is that Kuomo'o cannot completely be erased. Um, they live on in our aina, in our land. They live on in each and every one of us. We are the embodiment of the Kuomo'o that have brought us here. And it's our kuleana, our responsibility thus, to seek out these Kuomo'o, to find them, to come to understand them intimately within ourselves, and to ensure that they're maintained, to ensure that they're passed on to the next generation as we plant seeds of resistance that will bear fruits of resurgence for those who will follow in our paths, those who are following our Kuomo. <clears throat> and so I want to close my presentation out with uh, a few more poems uh, <laughs> as a way of uh, really expressing my great thanks and mahalo uh, to the people of this place, to all of you, and uh, to the oivi of this aina, you know, the native peoples of this land, um, because, you know, when I came here in 2011 and, and same when I came here again this, this, this trip, you know, I've really been touched by the generosity and the hospitality that's been shown to me and that was shown to all of us when our group came in 2011. Um, and, you know, the willingness to really take us in and feed us and share your stories with us, no matter what the circumstances were. Uh, no matter how difficult the circumstances may have been. And one experience in particular, um, at the close, at the end of our trip last time, we went to Chiem. And, um, you know, towards the end of that trip on the last day, we all gathered and we shared food. And then uh, we all shared stories and songs with each other. Um, and in that time, it reminded me as we were sharing these stories with e and songs with each other um, that in doing so, in sharing these, these songs and sharing these stories, we're perpetuating our own kuomo, and we're perpetuating that genealogy, those stories, our own ways of life. And in doing so, we also honor those ancestors, 
and we honor the places of those ancestors. We honor the places that we have come to know and the places that we come from. And so, you know, when uh, I was returning um, back home on my flight um, that trip, uh, this mele came to me. You know, I was thinking about it, and this mele, this poem came to me. Um, and I knew when it came to me that this would be a way um, of honoring the people of this place and ensuring that my descendants do not forget this relationship, this pathway that connects us, and ensuring that that pathway is maintained from here on out. Uh, and so it's a two-part mele um, poem. Uh, the first part is in Olel Hawaii, in Hawaiian language, and the second part is in English. Um, and so I'll, I'll say it now and then I'll, I'll explain it later. It's called Kapuna Vai Huauka and Pupa Akai. So, Ayala i Kapiko Kaina, He Puna Vai Huauka, Puka Mai Akahe Mau, Kavai Ikena Ke Kanaka, Nakavai e Hoola i Kaulili Makeala, Makea e Loa, Ku Mau Kavai a Hu Mau, Aola Kaina. In the wake of the great loss that our people have suffered, it would be easy to forget the first teachings that our ancestors uttered. Our wealth is defined by our relatives that provide, no matter the consequence, weather or tide. The lessons that guide our ways of living are embodied in reciprocity, sharing, and giving. Sit quietly and recall the example set by our grandmother, no grain of salt is too small to share with another. <clears throat> and so the first part, Kapuna Wai Huauka, it talks about and it compares the people of this place uh, to a spring at the top of a mountain, like you see here. <clears throat> Uh, and, it, and this spring never ceases to provide water for the people and the land, water and life for the people and the land. Uh, and these people on this, this water, uh, this spring, is what it sustains the ulili, the person who travels along that long ala ulili, that long trail on his long journey. Um, and these people, uh, in our experiences, uh, and my experiences coming here, um, the people are able to provide this uh, because of their aloha, their aloha for this land, their aloha aina, and standing firm in that aloha, that deep, deeply rooted love for this land. Um, and that really, that really, uh, that really influenced me when I came here. <clears throat> um, and we, and the spring in particular that I compare it to is uh, this spring here. At the top of our Mauna Awakea, this is Wael. Uh, and it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's the highest mountain. Uh, and this is the most sacred of waters. Uh, and this is the source of all the water for our Aina in Hamakua. This is the source of our, our aquifer. You know, this is where it all begins and it flows down from there. You're on an island, it all begins at the top of your mountain. And it flows down from there, feeding the people and the land. We call this the... We also call Wael the Pico Wakea, the umbilical, the navel of Wakea, the sky. And so this really is the embodiment for us of that connection. As just in the same way that your umbilical cord connects you to your mother, um, this is the umbilical cord that connects us to the land and to our gods, to Wakea, to the sky. <clears throat> and so uh, furthermore, in the, in, we also have... The word piko wakea, uh, which refers to this, wayao. Piko wakea is also our word for the equator and also for the equinox. So it's really talking about that central point when the sun is centered on the earth. And this is the center of our universe right here. Um, and this picture was actually taken on piko wakea, on the equinox. So it's all piko wakea there. And um, I have, actually, I have a... Uh, uh, copy of this picture that um, I wanted to leave for uh, the iGov program. And so 
maybe Jeff and Ty just came back. So, um, as uh, you know, acknowledging this um, this relationship and um, all of the gratitude and hospitality um, that was shown to us when we were here, and you know, this is my way of of saying mahalo honoring the people of this place, the spring, who never ceases to give, to give water to the land and the, and the people. So, wow. yeah. oh. okay. Okay. And the second part of that poem, the English part, uh, I call Pupa'akai. And um, Pupa'akai, in our language, we have a saying, if uh, akai kaku, and that means to share salt, and it's kind of like a humble way of saying inviting somebody to eat, um, even if all you have is salt, um, you still invite that person to eat, no matter how small or how little you have to give. Um, and so, you know, when we came here, um, that was really the amount of just generosity that was shown to us, no matter what it was, no matter where it was, no matter how many of us there were. Um, everything was shared openly with us. And so, you know, Pupa Akai Kako, we share in this, and I share with you what little knowledge, what, li what little I know of my place, and all of the, the recognizing all of the things that I still have to learn. And I mahalo you all for sharing with me in this time as well. Mahalo. This is uh, a picture from the top of Mauna Wakea about a month ago. So we do get snow in Hawaii. Uh, we had a pretty good snow this year. Uh, it just melted, so um, it's pretty, yeah, it was, it was a good sign. So um, I don't know if anybody has questions. Um, we'd be happy to continue the discussion, you know. Um, feel free. Mahalo. Thank you for talking about the place. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm glad you're back again for another uh, visit, too. Mahalo. Um, I'm interested about the, the website and uh -huh. uh, what the community's response has been to it and mm. like, who's accessing it and yeah, what yeah. they think of it. So, actually, right now, um, it's not fully live yet. Oh, wow. uh, this is my, uh, my project for my thesis. So. I just turned in the written portion two weeks ago, and I defend it in two weeks. So <laughs> I have to defend this to my committee uh, in two weeks. So this was kind of a dry run for me. So, um, but uh, you know, at least in terms of our own organization, our own hui, the ohana, um, they're really excited about it. You know, they're really excited about. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is new to us too. You know, finding out. You know about these different things in the newspapers, all these old maps, and uh, really reconnecting to these stories and these old place names uh, has been really cool. Uh, and to be able to see how that's impacted my own family, uh, it's been really transformative. You know, just starting with our own family first, um, and you start to see how people start to use those place names again. Uh, whereas, you know, the whole plantation industry kind of changed the landscape in a way that uh, they centralized communities and into plantation camps. And so big, broad areas kind of got known by the name of that camp or the name of that, that plantation. So like in this area, the nearest camp was Pa'awilo Camp. And so people kind of know it generally as Pa'awilo, you know, uh, not knowing that actually there's Koholalele, there's Kainehe, there's all these other places there. And so really trying to bring out those place names and all the knowledge that's embodied in each one of those place names. You know, um, one, of, one of the big focuses I've done is on Koholalele. And uh, really just from a place that I, you know, I grew up knowing that place, um, but not knowing much about what the place name meant. And then learning all of these connections with the Kohola, you know, the whale and how this place is connected to that whole journey, you know, and all of the knowledge that's embodied in that. Uh, it's really been transformative for me as well, you know. And 
in learning about my own homelands, where my, peop where my ancestors come from, I've learned about myself. Um, because that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole thing about it, right? It's like you learn your kuomo, you learn your genealogy, you learn about what makes you. Yeah? So, um, I hope that answers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you for sharing. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that uh, you came across newspaper clippings where elders uh, utilize that music technology to be able to share their stories. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if um, that has been something that has continued, like mm -hmm. writing down stories, because I know here, like, there's lots, we, we had lots of discussions in our classes about, mm -hmm. like, should we write them down in a long written format, like all yeah. that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, you know, there's actually a lot of uh, more and more uh, Hawaiian scholars and, you know, some of the kumu that uh, have come here, like kumu noi noi silva, that have really focused their whole work on, on these uh, scholarly ancestors of ours um, that wrote these stories in the newspapers. And, you know, I'm sure that they didn't write everything. Uh, we only know what they wrote. Um, and so, you know, we still, I think, I, I know I have struggled in terms of deciding what to write down, um, what to include in a website, and what not to. Um, because there is that, uh, you know, everything um, has kuleana. So our word kuleana is responsibility. It also means your rights. So it's one and the same. And... Um, that's one thing about having a website is that, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, it allows people access to knowledge and information that, um, not er that some people who might not have kuleana to that, that knowledge. And um, you know, even as Oivi, as ourselves, we recognize that we don't have kuleana to go everywhere within our own homelands. You, know? you cannot just go over to somebody else's place and expect to be able to do whatever you want there. You know? Uh, you earn those, you earn that by fulfilling your responsibilities to that place. And so that's something that, um, you know, I've really thought about a lot in how I can try to embed that in a website. And how you can make people earn that kuleana to that knowledge. Um, like one thing for the, for the trail, for that ala ulili part. It's, you know, right now you can click on any part of the mountain and go straight to it. Um, but one thing I've been thinking about is making people start at the bottom. And... To be able to see the top, you got to go through all the different realms, you know. That's the way we have to do it, you know, if you're going up there. So, um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's hard to say, you know, what, um, what, I think, you know, what, what we can learn from those kupuna, those ancestors that wrote in the newspapers is a lot of times they actually wrote out their intentions when they were writing these stories. They saw that um, our people were dying. Um, they saw that the language was being, you know, was changing because of the influx of missionaries, and especially when Americans took over, um, that the language, people were starting to speak English more, the language was starting to lose its, you know, hold with the new generations, and they saw that the stories were starting to be lost, and so they, when they wrote them down, they, they often said, I am writing this down so that the future generations will know these stories. And there's actually one author that uh, Kumu Noi Noi Silva is writing about uh, who explicitly said, you know, we need to make sure that we write down these stories and every detail of it so that, th you know, we may not care about it now, but those in the 1880s and the 1980s are going to want to know these things. And so, you know, that's really powerful to see how they had that kind of foresight at that time. And I think in terms of the work that I, I'm doing now, trying to have that same foresight, you know, in saying, you know, there is definite boundaries and kuleana to different knowledge and information, but we have to think ahead about how we're going to make sure, whatever form it takes, whether it's a website or whether it's passing it on orally, that to ensure that that, that knowledge is passed on. You know? So I, one kumu I have, um, kumu... Uh, Antipua Kanaka Ole, she says, no, no knowledge is too sacred not to be passed on.
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this, this project actually started out uh, when I was a kid. Uh, when I was in high school, we had a project uh, where to interview one of our elders. And um, so I went and talked to my grandpa. And my mom's dad and her dad were all born and raised here uh, in Kohulalele. And so that was, uh, he was my last living uh, grandparent. And so I went and talked to him. And uh, I recorded all of his stories. And it like hooked me, you know. I loved going from that day forward as a freshman in high school. You know, I, he had, I had gone up to these places with him before as a kid. Um, but after that, I, w I made it a point to go out there with him as much as I could. And, you know, my grandpa lived until he was 91. Um, and was in 2007 um, or 2008 that he passed away. And I had just, you know, I was a sophomore in college, and some people had, at the school had encouraged me to apply for a research grant and, you know, make this my, my undergraduate research to go home and to research the stories of this place and to really record the stories of my grandpa. Um, and that summer when I came home was the summer that, and I was about to start that project, was the summer that he passed away. And so it really was tough. Um, because, you know, that was what I, my whole plan was, was to work with my grandpa, to like record all these stories. But I was lucky that I had spent so much time with him uh, to that point that, you know, I had a pretty good, um, you know, hold on all of the stories he had shared with me. Um, and I had recorded it uh, myself. And so from there, it really forced me to branch out uh, into other families, other elders, other kupuna, uh, and then to go into the archives, you know, to go into um, the records that our, other, our ancestors from farther long ago had left for us. You know, all of these newspapers, that's a huge repository. I think they estimated about a million pages of, of newspapers written from like the 1830s up into the early 1900s in our language that have all these stories, you know. And so that's a huge repository that still a lot of people uh, are still going, in th going through. Um, and then also um, in the 1840s uh, is when the chiefs got together with some foreign advisors and they decided to go with a new system of private land ownership. And so that was when the first time that our lands were surveyed um, and people had to go through a process of submitting claims and testimonies about their land, where they're from. And what, one thing that that left for us today is this whole record of what the land was like at that time. And um, so that's a huge, another huge repository um, of information about our old place names, what people were growing on the land in particular places at that time, um, and as well as the families that were connected to those places that long ago. Uh, so that really has, power, has been powerful in helping people with genealogy research, with research that connects people to be able to get back to their family's land um, in that way as well. So it's been a real mixture of talking to our elders who are around today, and that was the first place I went, um, and then being out there on the land myself and applying what knowledge I had gained from my own family, my own grandfather growing up, and then uh, supplementing it with all the research I I came across, and the stories I came across in archives, in all of these records that have been left for us. Um, so it's really been a whole mix of things uh, that I think you have to be able to pull from all those different, you know, our genealogies, all of it, you know. So, mahalo. Yeah. Other than the website, what are some ways you're strategizing to counter that? And then also, um, how has Idle No More been kind of perceived or uh, ah. uh, thought about? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I can only speak for myself. Uh, our, our organization and our hui is hui malama ike alolili. Right now, our focus is mainly on where we're from, you know, and, and right now, primarily on taking care of our, our burial site, yeah. 
that's our main focus right now, is starting out. Um, but still with the consciousness that our struggle is connected to the struggle for to maintain the sanctity and the integrity of the top of our mountain. Um, and so, you know, there's been a number of people uh, that have been getting involved with um, legal struggles right now uh, in the courts, um, fighting to protect the mountain, fighting in the court system against this development, you know, trying to go that route. Um, but I think as it connects to this, for me, you know, and, and our way of standing in solidarity with that fight and also as a way of um, trying to build while it's like this balance between kue, you know, you, you're fighting and resisting and then building capacity at the same time, looking down the line, right? Uh, to try and build that, that mass, that, that uh, collective mass to be able to take on such a huge um, opponent as, you know, the state of Hawaii, the United States military, um, all of these things. Uh, and so in this sense, you know, trying to get out this information about the, about the sacredness of that landscape, reconnecting people to the stories and the genealogies that teach us about the sacredness of that place. Because even, um, you know, for me, growing up on that island, growing up knowing that mountain, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people at home that just don't know the history of that mountain, you know don't know these stories, don't know these genealogies because we've been so disconnected fr from them. Um, and so for me right now, I think that's the strategy that I've uh, taken in, in trying to cultivate that consciousness is that we need to get back to the root of why our ancestors taught us that this mountain was so secret. And it's because it gets down to these genealogies that tell us um, not only are we physically and genealogically related to this mountain, but this is where everything begins for us. You know, uh, on an island, everything starts at the top of your mountain. So if you poison the top of your mountain, you poison everything, you know. And so um, I think that education and that, that awareness building is really what we need for the long term. Um, as the fights continue to go on, you know, in the court system, as it gets closer to the time that... Um, you know, they're looking to actually build, then I'm sure you'll actually get more, um, you know, more physical, you know, kind of resistance. So, um, but then the second part of your question. Oh, uh, actually, you know, there's, I think, the, I, I don't know more, you know, we, we haven't had, you know, and it's been interesting for me coming here to get the perspective, um, you know, different perspectives here from people here who are involved in that movement, but, you know, it's really been interesting to see how it's kind of sparked a lot, I think, uh, at home, um, especially around issues that are going on right now uh, with GMO labeling. Uh, that's a big issue uh, that's kind of been headed up by Uncle Walter Reedy, guys. Um, and there's been marches going on all around the Hawaii. Um, and, it's, and a lot of the theme has been I don't know more um, and kind of standing in solidarity with that movement as well. Um, and then also there's been issues around um, this public land development corporation that was created by the governor, by the state, um, to create these public-private partnerships with the state to develop on public lands, which are actually all Hawaiian national lands, Hawaiian kingdom lands that were, you know, seized by the United States and given to the state. And, um, you know, it's kind of uh, sparked a, a, a movement of itself, I think, that's been inspired in a way by the I Don't Know, I don't know More movement here uh, and seeing what, what's all been going on, you know, in other places. Um, but it's really been interesting to be here to learn more about, you know, what's actually been going on here um, and to be able to uh, engage in that way about, it, about these issues, you know, because I think in a lot of ways we all are fighting the same kind of struggles when it gets down to the root of it. Uh, we all have our own uh, particular histories and, and places that we come from, but it's a lot of the same struggles, you know, so.
To be honest, uh, you know, I, I don't, I couldn't really see my, my research and the work that I'm doing falling into any any one of those uh, fields, those disciplines, and um, I didn't. I, I had a real hard time deciding on what program to even apply to because of that, because I wanted something that was interdisciplinary, you know, that it would allow me to draw on Hawaiian studies, Hawaiian language, you know geography, history, political science. Um, and what it really came down to, I think, was the fact that um, that program at, you know, at you know, pol political science, indigenous politics, um, and the faculty there really uh, supported and allowed me that opportunity to engage in that kind of uh, interdisciplinary work um, with a, a strong political consciousness. And so, that was what really attracted me to it, and really that um, they're supportive of uh, coming from an Oevi perspective, a Kanaka perspective on it. Uh, they are knowledgeable in our language, and you know, I really want to be able to do all of my research and even my writing in our language and that kind of stuff. And so, I think that was the main draw. Aside from you know it being political science, it really is. You know, I think the closest thing to a more broader indigenous politics, you know, kind of field there. So, yeah. Well, anybody else? Well, mahalo again. And uh, I'll be around here if you want to come talk stories. You don't want to ask questions in front of everybody. So, mahalo again. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank <laughs> you.